Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steve Miller, and I'm the Global Product Manager for Preheater at Ethel Smith. Uh, that includes having global responsibility for clay calcining technology. Today, I'll talk to you about a few subjects regarding calcined clay. Uh, first, we'll start with drivers and roadblocks that we're seeing in the industry. Talk about clay sourcing, how important it is to get a good clay source for making calcined clay. And um, I'll talk about our patent pending calcining clay, uh, clay calcining technology using the calciner. And then finally, we'll wrap up. You see a number of drivers for calcined clay projects today across the industry. Uh, certainly, uh, first and foremost is to make green cement and be sustainable, where we can use calcined clay to lower CO2 emissions uh, and gain CO2 cr credits, or conversely, uh, lower CO2 tax uh, taxes. Uh, calcined clay can be used to get a small production increase. Uh, it has lower capex and opex uh, per ton compared to clinker, so you can lower your uh, operating costs by increasing capacity uh, by using calcined clay instead of making more clinker. And of course, this has the added benefit of lowering CO2 emissions. Uh, reduced availability of flash and slag. Both flash and slag are additives both to cement and to concrete. Um, as power plants go to more sustainable fuels uh, and, and slow down on burning coal, we're going to see fly ash reducing in the future in terms of its availability. And the same thing for slag, which is a byproduct of the steel industry, as they go to more sustainable production, it's expected that the amount of slag available around the world will decrease. And then the final driver uh, that we see is uh, in some places around the world, limestone just isn't available locally. Uh, these plants have to import clinker. However, they do have clay available and by building a clay calcining plant, they can reduce the amount of importing they have to do of clinker. It can reduce the overall costs for supplying cement to their local market. You see a number of roadblocks and challenges from our discussions with customers uh, around the world. And these are some examples. Uh, one is just slag and flash are still readily available. Uh, they're both uh, as byproducts are very low cost compared to calcine and clay. So as long as slag or fly ash continue to be available in certain local markets, it's going to be very difficult to economically justify building a calcine clay project. Some places we see lack of familiarity and knowledge with codes when it comes to using calcine clay and cement or concrete. Uh, there are many places in the world that have updated their codes and are, are readily uh, available for using calcine clay, but in other places, uh, some codes need to be updated and uh, the end users need to get more familiar with using these products to know that they're going to be just as good as using traditional cement. Uh, one another issue is permitting. Um, when you build a new calcine clay plant, are you going to follow cement emissions at rules in terms of NOx, SO2, and, and particulate matter, or are you going to follow something else uh, depending on whether you're building it within an existing cement plant or you're building a complete greenfield site, we have seen some differences of what some of our customers may have to uh, endure in order to gain their permit and what they'll have to uh, concur with when they build a new site. And then finally, we have uh, the issue of whether calcine clay is going to be used as a clinker replacement or as a concrete additive. Uh, certainly what the cement producers that we speak to, uh, they're going to plan to use it as a clinker replacement. However, uh, in addition to cement producers, we've also talked to people in ready mix or people that are just raw material suppliers where they want to make calcine clay. Uh, either they have already a waste material that they could use or they have a quarry available and they want to make a calcine clay and sell it to the ready mix companies as a concrete additive. Uh, and we have seen in some cases that the quality requirements for calcine clay as a clinker replacement can be a little different for what it might be if it's used as a concrete additive. When it comes to starting and planning for a calcine clay project, it's very important in the beginning to make sure you have a good source. Uh, not all clays are equal. Clay is a collective term for many different minerals, so uh, we recommend doing a viability review to make sure that your clay is a good source. Uh, the listing here goes through the different areas we recommend. The flow chart kind of shows it in a pictorial way, which I'll not cover in detail. Uh, first, we start with an X-ray diffraction uh, or XRF, where we look at the oxide content of the clay, mainly focusing on silica, aluminum, and iron. Then we'd look at the XRD or uh, X-ray diffraction, which shows the mineral content and how many of the, each of the clay minerals are involved, certainly kaolinite being the main mineral we look at for strength development. Uh, but there are other minerals, such as illites, micas, mectites, that can also develop strength. On the other hand, there are other clays that are completely inert uh, and cause other problems, such as quartz, 
courts won't develop any strength and in courts in large amounts can create problems with high amounts of wear and very hard to grind uh, product when it comes to calcium clay. Uh, next, we need to look at emissions potential, and uh, sometimes this is overlooked in some cases, but you can get NOx and certainly SO2 from, from calcined clay. In fact, with calcined clay production, you don't have the amount of free lime in the calciner like you do with thinker production, which can absorb uh, much of the SO2 and, and send it out with the product. Even small amounts of pyritic sulfur with the clay or with the fuel input can create large SO2 emissions, which could lead to very expensive control equipment in order to reduce emissions. Uh, with everything looks good uh, for the clay, then we'd like to get into some lab and pilot activation, including color control, again, to make sure we're going to get a good product, make sure we can achieve color, uh, and also look at the clay product analysis to make sure we can get the strengths and the quality that we need for a good product. Here you can see a photo of our pilot installation in Denmark, where we can take the calcine clay production to a larger scale to prove that we're going to get good quality color control and emissions with a full scale calcine clay project. Uh, and again, this can give our customers uh, peace of mind that uh, if they make the investment that they're going to get a good product. Uh, another important part of the testing, of course, is the color control, like I mentioned earlier. Here you can see an example where we ran the same exact play through the system with and without color control. Uh, without the color control, the iron content in the clay can oxidize into a hematite, which gives this reddish rust color. Uh, with the reduction uh, system in place in order to do the color control, we can prevent uh, the oxidation and produce a mineral called magnetite, which is gray in color which does not cause any issues. And again, with the color, this is not a quality issue. It doesn't actually impact the strengths when it changes color. This is more of a visual issue that can become a problem with the color of the final product. See an example of the Ethel Smith calcine clay system. The pointer, uh, the fresh feed comes in here to a crusher dryer. This is a air swept hammer mill. Uh, it's an Ethel S. Smith product, which does the grinding and frying in one unit takes the hot gas from the pre-eater and grinds it down to a product fineness of approximately 25 to 30 percent plus 90 micron which is slightly coarser than a typical raw mix fineness for a clinker production system the material is collected in a dust collector taken into a sometimes storage bin or silo before being fed into the preheater there'll be one or two or three stages of preheat depending on how much moisture is in the clay and how much we need to, to do drying after the material is preheated in the top of the tower, then it's fed to the calciner where we do the calcination. Calciner is designed very similarly to a calciner you would see in a clinker plant in terms of the velocity and the residence time. Fuel here is fired in the bottom. This can be um, any type of fossil fuel or in some cases, certain waste fuels in order to get the, the temperature that we need to do the calcination. This temperature uh, in the bottom stage typically controls the fuel automatically. And in industrial units, uh, we can expect the temperature somewhere in the range of 800 to 850 centigrade. Here we can see there a startup air heater. This is typically just for startup to get the temperature in the riser area hot enough so that we can achieve auto ignition. Once this is achieved, usually the air heater is turned off. After the material is, is calcined, it's taken into the reduction zone. Uh, this is essentially uh, an aerated uh, area where we produce uh, and put in a small amount of waste fuel to maintain reducing conditions to ensure that we to keep the color on gray instead of going into red. From there, we go into a set of cooling cyclones, and uh, here we show three cooling cyclones. In some cases, it may be two, uh, depending on the, the, the heat balance around the system. We use ambient air here from a fan that goes into the cyclones to cool the cloud side clay to a final temperature of 80 to 100 to C above ambient. Uh, by heating up the cooling air and taking into the calciner, we can recover a lot of the heat from the clay that's calcined, and this is, gives us the ability to minimize our fuel consumption, especially con compared to cases where water quenching is used instead of air quenching, where the heat uh, used to evaporate the water as part of the cooling is much more difficult to recuperate. If you look at some typical OPEX numbers, uh, with 20% feed moisture and 10% LOI, the fuel consumption is going to be around 425 kilograms per head cup per kilogram, and the power is going to be in the range of 12 to 14 kilowatt per ton, with the main power consumers being the, the ID fan, the crusher dryer, the cooling fan. Here you can see a typical 3D layout. Uh, the tower itself has uh, the site cooling cyclones, the calciner and the pre-air cyclones all integrated, and is about 60 meters tall, with an area of about 10 meters by 10 meters. 
the feed comes into the crusher dryer here with the gas from the preheater also going into the crusher dryer. It's vented to the filter, a fan, and then out to a stack. The product is coming out the bottom and then fed to a silo. And uh, we normally recommend, since most of the product is fine enough, to go out into the cement that we feed directly to the separator of the finished mill so that any fines can go out in the final product and only a small amount of coarse material can be fed back into the mill for final grinding. Thank you for your time and attention and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that you may have.